How are you, everybody? Uh, we are here in the blue basement for a very uh, special interview. I'm here with John Danaher, of Good course. John, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, here in, in the blue basement. We're getting ready for, for ADCC, right? We yes. just, just wrapped things up, uh, the first training session of the day. And uh, of course, I always love coming here, seeing the, some of the most high level training in the world right here. But we were just talking um, a minute ago about ADCC, and I was, I was wondering, actually, when, when your first, the first um, ADCC that, that you were, went uh, to yeah, was? Yeah, it was, it was UFC, uh, sorry, uh, ADCC Brazil, um, when uh, the squad was in its infancy, and mm. uh, a young... 2015? Yeah, 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 and Eddie Cummings and uh, Gary Tonin came out, and um, you must remember that was a, a, a very early phase for the squad where our, our primary emphasis was on pure submission grappling. Um, most of our uh, emphasis in, in daily training was getting ready for EBI events where the emphasis is on pure submission. You, there's no points scored, uh, uh, there's an overtime which is based around submission holds. And so um, the whole emphasis of the training room was very much a very pure submission grappling, no time limit fights and EBI. And so um, making the switch to ADCC was, uh, uh, it was interesting to see someone from that pure submission background go into an ADCC tournament where the majority of matches are won by points. And um, if I remember correctly, uh, Gary and Eddie both won very well with leg locks in their first matches, but dropped on points in the, in the second one. So um, when we prepared next time, the, 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 the squad training had changed a little bit. We, um, there was a, a more versatile squad, which is going in the direction of both submission only um, and also points tournaments. And uh, the training was significantly different uh, that second time around. And um, Did you feel like you, you made adjustments after seeing what happened in, in actually, 2015? Actually, or? no. Um, we, we could have prepared that way in, in 2015 also. Uh, it wasn't like I didn't know the rules sure. of ADCC or something like that. But um, uh, I, do, I, I did have a, a program in mind that in those early days, which was a very pure form of submission grappling. Um, I, I had a belief uh, that Jiu-Jitsu had gone too much towards point scoring and advantages and that Jiu-Jitsu, in a sense, needed to be pushed back towards submission grappling. Thankfully, at that time, there was a, a host of new sub, uh, submission-only tournaments that were cropping up. EBI was the most famous, but there were many others too. And um, they gave a wonderful opportunity for young athletes to, uh, to change the way that people looked at Jiu-Jitsu and the, a kind of a, a movement developed, the submission-only movement. And uh, it, it caught a lot of interest mm. uh, among people. And, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, there was always this persistent criticism uh, that the, the squad, these kids who, they, they would do well in uh, submission only, but if they went to a point somewhere, they wouldn't do well. They lacked versatility. And so um, uh, I, I thought, you know, well, uh, it's an easy thing to train. Let's see how we do and train, change the training uh, and start to add positional concerns along with our traditional submission heavy approach. And uh, so when we went to Europe for the next ADCC, um, uh, we had many people qualify. I think we had one of the largest teams in ADCC history go to the event. Uh, they'd all qualified. Um, the only exception was Nicky Ryan who had almost qualified. He got two silver medals in the North American trials. But uh, because someone pulled out at the last minute, he got an invite. That was, uh, that was the, uh, how he got into the event. And, um, uh, and probably Gordon Ryan did best. He mm -hmm. had an outstanding performance at that ADCC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2017 in Finland. Um, yeah. I, I was there. We both were there for that one. Um, for me, it was it was just in, in such an insane, it was such a magical place. Really, yeah, it was like the entire yeah. jiu-jitsu world was in Helsinki, Finland, or Espoo, Finland, right for the for this tournament. You say, you say it was interesting. It, it really was because it's such a small town. Yeah, uh, uh, it was outside of Helsinki. It was in Espoo, and you suddenly had uh, a large number of people from all over the world who were just engaged in grappling in a, in a very small, quiet 
area yeah. and it, it literally transformed the town it was it quite did. interesting it did. It, it, i felt like people kept asking me when, when are you guys leaving yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> you can't, but, can't blame them yeah because yeah, it was like you you would go uh, go into a restaurant just a random restaurant and you'd see like five world champions exactly yeah. and then you'd see leandra Lowe and, and henzo gracie and, and everybody yeah. you know sit, sitting down eating it was just it was really a a, a magical place um you know and, and it, of course a, a great great tournament and and um we we'll talk a little bit about 2017 for for a second because yeah. um, a great tournament and it was an even a better tournament I, I think for, for the squad and specifically um, Gordon Ryan. And yeah. th this was um, the, the the two days both both days um, there of the tournament just um, an incredible performance from from Gordon. This this was really one of the best performances you know in ADCC history. I think yeah. I think he had five five submissions. I'm not sure if anybody else is ever uh, secured five submissions in, in a... I think uh, it was uh, the most successful debut performance and, in ADCC history. And it was his, first, his, his yeah. first, um, yeah, his first time yeah. at ADCC. It, it was a remarkable fact. It was, it was, first, it was a debut performance, mm -hmm. um, uh, and the submission rate was, uh, I believe, unprecedented yeah. for a debut performance. And uh, uh, it really caught people's imagination. Also, because of the nature of the matchmaking, he went against some of the absolute legends of the sport mm -hmm. and uh, and did particularly well in those matches. Yeah, he had you know probably one of the hardest roads to the finals, or uh, uh, one of the hardest roads to gold. Um, he had Shanji and, and Dylan Dennis in the first round. He, he fought Keenan in the finals. Um, you know, obviously, you guys spent a lot of time working on ADCC 2017, mm. and, and when you were, were here in the room, did you ever envision it going that well for Gordon? Um, yeah, uh, I, I never try to have expectations. Uh, that's a good way to be disappointed, because mm. at world championship level, the difference between the guy who gets the gold medal and the guy who gets seventh, eighth place is it's pretty small. Mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of variables that can happen. You can get food poisoning two days before the event. You can you can, you can break a thumb in the last week of training. It, there's so many things that can happen that can take your performance down two to three percent and that might be the difference between the gold medal and quarterfinals loss. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I always try hard not to have expectations. M my job as a coach is to give everyone the greatest po po uh, possible chance of success leading up to the event. But what happens on the, on the mat, I try not to have expectations about that. I knew that Gordon was going to be a very tough opponent for anyone he went against. Yeah. That, that I was very confident of. <laughs> but I never, you know, had this idea, okay, he's got to win the gold. So that, that's not the way I think. Um, it was also a remarkable performance for many of the juniors who went in with very, very little experience in that domain or, or any domain. A lot of them were just kids. I think um, Nicky Ryan was probably the youngest competitor ever at yeah. ADCC. And, uh, and they all had outstanding matches, even when they lost. Um, always my thinking is in terms of long term and the truth is that all of those fellows are very very young and mm -hmm. they're still comparatively inexperienced um, uh, so they've got a long time ahead of them in this sport and there's no reason why you know a decade from now they can't all be world champions what did you think um it did for the rest of the squad to see one of their own, you know, young guy like Gordon go out there and, and do what he did and, and, and claim the gold and, and show that, mm. you know, it, yeah. it, it was possible for everybody. Yeah, what, I, what did you think it, of that? That's, that's always a huge, huge thing. Um, we all stand in need of role models. We all have doubts, okay? Sometimes you look around the room and, and you're like, man, is this the right way to train? How, how are the other guys training? Should I be doing what they're doing? It's natural to have doubts. And so when you get positive reinforcement when you see one of the, you guys going out and, and winning it's 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 an affirmation like hey, we're doing this the right way this is this is working and um, uh, you see it to a lesser extent at North American ADCC trials when you're you know when you're winning trials okay we're doing something right mm -hmm. and um, uh, it, it's a wonderful thing for the younger students to be able to see someone that they work out with every day and they know very well and he's doing the same thing that they're doing winning gold medals that's that's a huge confidence booster for everybody do, do you feel like there was a, a new a renewed focus or right after adcc um, or? To, to be honest we we switch directions so quickly after adcc then uh some guys had to get ready for mixed martial arts mm. um some guys had to go and help george st pierre prepare for his fight with michael bisping it's just 
one thing onto on another. The next thing. Like uh, the, the day you start getting nostalgic and, and looking back and saying, oh, remember the good old days? When, no, you, you've lost it at that point. Uh, better to take your wins and move on to something new. So now we are two, two years later. Yeah. Can, you, can you believe that that was two years ago? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it seems like yesterday. It but does, yeah, right? Yeah. It does. Yeah. It, it really does. But uh, two years later, um, a lot has happened, mm. it, it feels like, in, in the world of jiu-jitsu. It, it feels like um, a little bit of a, of a different scene now. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think are, the, are maybe the, the biggest changes from, from two years ago to, to now in, um. in the nogi grappling scene? Uh, I think you saw a lot of those changes at the North American trials. Like uh, if you looked at North American ADCC trials, you saw a significantly different approach to, uh, to grappling overall. The, the number of leg lock submissions was up by, I don't know what the percentage points are, but it was considerable. Yeah. Like the, the game has changed significantly. If you look at footage of ADCC North American trials from say seven years ago, Ten years ago, it looks like a different sport. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people are coming out, engaging the legs, looking for reactions off that. Um, uh, the integration between jiu-jitsu and wrestling has improved uh, dramatically, and um, uh, it looks good for the future of the sport. Mm -hmm. And you definitely have to, you know, give credit where, where credit is due. I think you know you were obviously a very big part, and, and congratulations on on. Um all your, your, your DVDs and BJJ Fanatics oh, that, you. that you're yeah. doing. It seems like um, things have been going super well. And, and I know, it, you know, in terms of the internet, it feels like everybody's talking about your, your DVDs and, and, um, and the, the leg locks especially. So definitely wanted to congratulate you on that. Um, but do you, do you feel like that, um, I don't know, do you feel some, some sense of pride in, in the way that things have changed? Because I, I, I do genuinely think, and I, I don't think I'm out of, out of line in saying that I, I, you, you definitely impacted um, a lot of these changes. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that my students were able to do this. Uh, the, the truth is, I'm a guy that teaches seven days a week in a basement. It, <laughs> if it wasn't for my students, no one would even know what my name was. Um, and so the, the, the people who deserves a lion's share of the credit of my students. Um, uh, I, I've shown them a lot, but uh, they too are very innovative people. They mm -hmm. come up with their own uh, modifications and things that I show. And um, They've done an incredible job of, of taking what we work here every day, taking it out onto the big stage and, and winning matches with it over a long period of time. And um, so uh, most of the pride that I have is for their accomplishments because without them no one would know who I was. Sure. Um, you, you, you mentioned uh, the North American trials though yeah. and um, we were the, there for both the East Coast and uh, West Coast trials and uh, Ethan of course won the East Coast trials and, and um, Nikki yes. won the, the West Coast trials. Um, both guys um, very impressive fashion. I believe Nikki submitted all his fights and, yeah. and Ethan submitted all, all, all but, but one. one. Um, so, very impressive performances from these the, the junior members of the squad this second time around. But I want to talk about Nicky um, specifically. Um, you know, he was like you said, the youngest guy to compete. I believe he was 16 years old yeah. the last time around. You know, now he's a uh, older, a little wiser. We saw him at the the West Coast Trials. He and just turned 18. Just turned so, 18. Yeah. So he's 18 now. He was 17 when he won trials and turned 18 subsequently. Gotcha, gotcha. Were you impressed with his um, trials performance? No, he sucked. <laughs> 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 but, um, uh, no, Nicky is one of the most remarkable people I've ever coached in my life. There's, there's no really? question about that. Right. Um, uh, I mean, you saw it for yourself watching him roll this morning. Mm -hmm. He looks like a human highlight reel every time he steps on the mat. Um, He's like a little guided missile, which is has a seeker for the back and the legs, and he just plays between those two, and it's a nightmare to get away from. Um, uh, he's he's very very talented. Um, he's also incredibly hard working. You know, just to get here for the morning class, yeah. the kid has to beat the traffic to get into Manhattan. He's getting up at five in the morning, coming in here, and he'll work out again, and then he'll go home to New Jersey and teach at night. Um, he, these kids, there's deserve so much credit for the, the work ethic they show on a daily basis. Uh, we were here yesterday slogging out ADCC training and uh, talking afterwards and, and he had to drive home. Now he's back here in the morning. Um, they, they do the work yeah. and uh, it's, it's, it's extremely impressive. At the trials, uh, I watched Nikki's preparation obviously and um, 
again, I don't have expectations, but I was very confident he would do well. Um, he's, uh, you know, there's, there's always concern, w will a guy translate his gym performances to, to, to uh, competition scenarios? And uh, I must say the Ryan brothers both do an extraordinary job of that. They, they both have a lot of confidence in their ability to go out and, uh, and do the, what they do in the gym out during the stage. And um, uh, that's not something you can really coach. Mm. That's something that comes from within the athlete. Mm. Uh, I can coach technique, tactic, strategy, but at the end of the day, it's not me who pulls the trigger, it's them. And those moments where you get to pull the trigger, they only last for a fraction of a second. And you can either hang back or you can go in and fire. And uh, those kids, when, then when the time comes, those two kids fire. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, definitely have been able to, to witness that. That's, that's yeah. been special. Um, but Nikki, like you mentioned, is getting older mm. and uh, 18 years old. Now he won the trials at, at 66. Yes. And um, then a, um, a little while later, we learned that he was moving up to the 77 um, kilogram division. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big thing. Um, mm -hmm. the, the reasoning behind it is simple. Um, uh, again, I, I always think long term. Uh, for Nikki to make weight, he could do it. There's no question about that. But to be honest with you, I worry long term about Nikki doing weight cuts during. Uh, a period when he should be focused on physical growth mm -hmm. and um, uh, there's there's mixed when you look at the medical evidence there's mixed reviews about the effect of weight cuts on adolescents and teenagers who are in growth spurts and uh, my thinking is Nicky's got many ADCC's ahead of him yeah. this is not going to be his last ADCC so let's think long term and let's focus on trying to use nutrition to be as big as you can so that when you're an adult, let's worry more about your adult career than your teenage career. And uh, Nicky was um, uh, was very much in favor of that kind of thinking. So he went up a weight division, so he, he will actually be, I think, by far and away the smallest person in his weight division. Yeah. That, that could potentially be a problem. But as I said, I'm thinking about Nicky when he's 25, 28, 30, Long term. rather than when he's 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I would rather see Nicky focus on his adult career rather than his teenage career. Do you think he'll, he'll be as, as big as Gordon? I don't believe so. Uh, if you look at their family genetics, there's quite a bit of variation in height. And um, I, I think Gordon was the upper end of their genetic height potential and Nikki is the lower end. I could be wrong, you know. I've seen late growth spurts, it can happen. Sure, sure. Um, uh, but I don't think he's gonna be as big as Gordon. No. Gotcha. I think he'd be more like Gary Tonner size. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the is the biggest um, difference between Nikki in in 2017 to, to Nikki in 2019? Oh, that's a great question. Um, he's uh, significantly better in the standing position. Uh, he was already very good on the ground. Um, uh, mechanically, the tightness of his locks and strangles has improved. Um, that's very important in competition because no one taps for free at World Championships. You've got to threatened to break people or strangle them unconscious. Mm -hmm. So um, th this the sheer mechanical tightness is there. Um, guard retention is significantly improved and standing position is uh, significantly improved. Wow. So, uh, uh, and it, of course, we all know that, that uh, there's a big emphasis on, on the wrestling yeah. in, in um, ADCC. Do you feel like that he lacked that in, in, um, in 2017 or, or just he's better now? He's just better now. He's just yeah. better now. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Um, Another guy, I mean, there's, there's so many guys you got going to ADCC uh, from the gym, and there's a lot of ADCC experience on this, these mats. Um, but another guy I wanted to um, ask you about is a um, uh, brand new guy to, to the gym and, and to, to jiu-jitsu as a whole, I guess, is, is this Nicky Rodriguez, yeah. who, who uh, <laughs> I believe has been, been training with you for maybe the past year. Yes. I'm not sure, yeah. or some, somewhere around there. Gordon Borderman, he's, yeah. he's a freak. Um, what can you tell us about Nicky? Because because he has just exploded onto the scene. He's a he's a brash personality. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's quite a character. Yeah, yeah. He's um, kind of. I'm going to start you off with literally the great the greatest jujitsu quote <laughs> ever ever spoken was from Nick Rodriguez. One day, um, we were doing some back attack scenarios, and you know we we have a fairly elaborate back attack mm. system, and um, my students use it all the time in competition. They're very successful with it. And um, 
Nick Rodriguez, I'm running him through some of the the back attack uh, system details, and he's he's doing pretty well with it. And when it's time for live training, he's just finishing people left and right. And uh, at the end of it, he goes like, "Yeah, I don't remember too much about that arm trap stuff, but I know one thing: if I can lock my hands anywhere below your eyebrows." I'm going to strangle you unconscious. Below the eyebrows. Below the eyebrows. I was like, whoa, okay. Um, that makes things a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, forget that whole system. It's just get them below the eyebrows, kid. You, you'll do fine. Um, and, and the scary thing is, he's pretty much correct. Yeah, he's yeah. not lying about yeah, it, right? Yeah, and um, I, I'm, I'm, it's crazy. But yeah, he's very, very talented. Uh, people think he was like some kind of crazy expert wrestler who came in with 20 years of wrestling. He's not. He did mm -hmm. one year of wrestling in Division Three. Um, so he's competent at wrestling, but he's not like a, you know, NCAA champion or anything yeah. like that. He's, just, uh, but um, I've never seen anyone of that size who is as flexible as he is. He can do a full split. Um, uh, he has the kind of flexibility required for jiu-jitsu where you can pull feet and knees in towards your body. At the same time, he can back arch perfectly normally you have one or the other mm -hmm. you can either be flexible forward for jiu-jitsu or you can be arching backwards for wrestling he's one of the very few people who has both and he's as fast as a cheetah um, uh, so yeah he's an extraordinary fellow <laughs> yeah I'm really excited to see how, how he, yeah. he does yeah. the ADCC I think what freaks people out and at the ADCC trials what really impressed people is that he's doing moves that you only see in the lightweight divisions mm -hmm. at heavyweight and uh, I think the heavyweights just literally had no idea what was happening. When sure. they see a guy like cartwheeling over and doing kimura rolls and stuff, it's like, this just never happens to me. And they had no idea how to deal with it. And uh, it was quite shocking. Yeah, he looks, he's so agile out there, yeah. for sure. Where, where do you think his, his ceiling, ceiling is? I know he's, he's, he's very young, he's very new to the sport, yeah. but, but um, you know, I, do you I, see the dedication in him? Do you, do you see? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is another guy who he, he lives even further away than Gordon and Nicky do. He's like another hour out beyond them and still comes in. Um, uh, so people can talk what they want about you know, people's personality. Oh, this guy's brash or does this and does that. I don't care about any of those things. What I care about is the numbers. Okay? And when someone's prepared to drive in three and a half hours and then three and a half hours back home to get a workout in, that speaks to me a lot more than anything you can say about their personality or what words they use or what have you. Every day I get people coming to the gym and say, John, I'm going to be your next world champion. I just look at them and smile and walk away. Because I don't care. Words mean nothing to me. Show me what you're doing. Show me what your actions are. And when someone's showing that kind of dedication, I'm willing to drive three hours to get there and three hours back to get one workout in with you. That, that's a statement. And um, you've got to take someone like that seriously. Mm -hmm. And he, he has a... He has a, a great division, that, that over-99 oh, division. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with Bouchesha and That's like the Muhammad superstar Ali. division. Yeah, yeah, it really is. There, there is so many good guys in there. So to see him uh, mix Muhammad it up. Muhammad Ali went up this year, correct? He did. He yeah. went up. He, yeah. he got a lot bigger. So. He got a lot bigger, but I believe um, Tim Spriggs, his teammate, was in. Uh, that was the reason for it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I believe But he, he won't be a small guy. He, in won't, he won't be outsized. Yeah. I don't think so yeah. at all. Um, Bahamut was there was there last year. He fought Gordon in the absolute yeah. division. Actually, he actually had a very good ADCC mm -hmm. uh, in his weight division. He did very well. He got he hooked quickly by Gordon, so people forgot. Him. They they tend to remember that. But yep. uh, in his weight division, he had some spectacular matches. Yeah, he's not another a very agile and um, exciting grappler yeah. to watch. Yeah. I would love to see him versus <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Nick uh, Anything could happen. Yeah. <laughs> They'll real. probably knock out the referee. For and, real. You know, the <laughs> referee gonna, will be, you know, get crushed. You need a couple couple more mats to contain yeah. this too. <laughs> Um, but this ADCC, especially this year, you know, you know, always ADCC is a is a big competition. It's a prestigious competition. But this year, especially, it really it really feels like um, that the, the level is is higher than it has ever been. You know, it, it being in Los Angeles this time around, I think is going to. It's been a long time since it was in America. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it's I think it's really gonna you know. Um, open up the accessibility for fans to, to watch and, and, and follow this tournament. Um, you know, for, for people who don't know, though, about ADCC, and about the history, maybe the prestige, you know, what, what is so alluring about, this, about winning this tournament? What, what is the big deal, I guess, yeah. right? That's, that's a good question. Um, I think any serious sport has to have 
some kind of world championship. People want to know who's the best guy in the world. Mm. There's, there's always that question. Okay, if this guy's good, that guy's good. Okay, who's the best? Show me who the best guy is. Um, if you look at uh, freestyle wrestling, you look at uh, international judo, they have an, an accredited world championship. And uh, everything's the, the big question, okay, who's the current world champ? That gives you an immediate sense of who's the the best guy out there and, and and people aim for that and aspire towards it because you have a very direct goal so the athletes benefit from it there's the ideal I want to be a world champion um, and the spectators benefit from it they know who they should focus their attention on these are the best people um, nothing crystallizes attention in both the athletes and the spectators like a world championship now the problem with grappling is that it, for the longest time had no real world championships even even the IBJJF World Championship is a relatively recent thing. Mm -hmm. uh, 92 was yeah, the first one. Yeah. 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 Jiu-Jitsu have been around a lot longer than the World Championships had. And uh, even the first World Championships were not that big of an event in Brazil. It took a while, but it wasn't until 2000 that they became a big deal. And there was a couple World yeah, Championships. Yeah, it was kind, were, it was kind of sketchy. Was yeah, like, like which one is which? Yeah, exactly. Now, then one emerged and the sport took off. Okay. Um, similarly, with submission grappling it didn't really have any kind of accredited world championship um, the only people who in the sport who really had the the financial ability to, to do that were the, uh, the team in Abu Dhabi and they put together a first world championship they were able using their connections and uh, uh, the finances that they had to put forward a, a serious event um, and the early events had a kind of exoticism to them. They were in the Middle East, uh, which is not really a recognized center of submission grappling at that time. And uh, you, like we talked about before, suddenly you had teams of the best guys in the world showing up in this rather exotic event. In those days, you could only get VHS videos of it yeah. and, you, and you would watch and they have these crazy Middle Eastern soundtracks and you watch people grapple with no commentators. It was kind of a bizarre thing. <laughs> but in time it matured. And, uh, uh, and it became a standout and, and in time by around, you know, uh, t somewhere between like 2003 you had, uh, that was a big one, I believe that was the one in Brazil that, that garnered a lot of attention and by then you had like a mature world championships that people took very, very seriously and, um, uh, and, and the sport took off from there. So I, I think there's just an innate need for a world championship, both spectators and athletes want it. They want to know who's the top dog. That, that's you know, show me the best person. That's the, that's the greatest motivator you can ever be. You know, um, and uh, it takes time to develop for both the uh, the gi community with the IBJF World Championship. It took some time with ADCC. It took some time. That those two organizations outlasted the competition, and they're still here today and growing. And the others are gone. They're dinosaurs. Um, so yeah, yeah. And unequivocally, the the winner at ADCC is the best in the world, right? That, I mean, that that's. It, it, there's always going to be people who argue, but show show me a better criteria. Okay, you you go in there. Um, there's many exciting events. Um, there's many events that have a certain kind of appeal to them, but there's no event where you just see just the sheer depth of talent that you do in ADCC. Nothing else matches it. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll see some events where there's one or two guys that are damn good or might even be ADCC champions themselves but it's one or two guys you don't go into a locker room and see 45 dudes who are like absolute killers uh, that's only in ADCC do, do you feel like it, um, even since you know 20, 2003 uh, when, it, when it kind of solidified itself you, you know do you feel like it, it's gotten better and better the, the, the level of jiu jitsu would, would it oh, be yeah, would yeah. it be a fair statement to yeah. say that the, um, that in 2019 this is the, the highest level ADCC's ever yeah. seen um, I, I'm, I'm a huge huge believer in the idea of progress over time um, I believe that uh, in, in, in the, the ability the cumulative ability of humans to increase performance levels over time um, just as Jesse Owens was a great sprinter but in no way shape or form could you compare him to the sprinters of today like Usain Bolt is demonstrably faster than Jesse Owens mm -hmm. now I know there's elements that can uh, sway this they wore different shoes back then they ran on different tracks but 
don't kid yourself. Usain Bolt is faster than Jesse Owens. That doesn't mean Jesse Owens wasn't a great sprinter for his time, but over time, humans make progress. And the athletes of today lift heavier weights, run faster than the athletes of yesteryear. Um, and I don't believe that Jiu-Jitsu is any exception to this. Uh, I do believe the athletes of today, if they were put in time machines, went back into early ADCCs, would, would significantly outperform the majority of athletes from those earlier times. It's just the way it works, and it's the way it should work. If it doesn't work that way, that means that coaches and athletes aren't doing their job. We learn from previous generations. If we're not better than previous generations, we're not learning, and then we're failures. Um, and so there must be this progress, and so I'm always going to come back with the answer as time progresses, as a general trend, the level of athletic performance will increase. There are some exceptions to that. There can be downturns due to outside factors where a sport can go backwards for a short period of time. But progress in athletics is rather like progress in the, in the stock market. There can be dips and moves, but over time there's a general upward progression. What do you expect to see, I guess, at, at um, 2019 ADCC? You know, because I think we talked, we, I remember coming here uh, beforehand, and, and I feel like we talked so much about mm. the leg locks um, in, in 2017 um, when, I was, when I was here before that. And, and I think, you know, obviously, we're, I'm sure you're expecting some, some wrestling. That, that seems to be, yep. to be the, the one constant. But in, in, in terms of the jiu-jitsu, I don't know, if you can maybe expand. I think, um, uh the, the leg lock revolution has spread so far and wide at this point that uh, who does best in ADCC is going to be the ones who react best to the, the, the changes in the game through leg locking. Mm -hmm. um, the level of resistance to leg locking is going to be much higher this year gotcha. than previous years. People aren't naive anymore. Yeah. And um, it's not like the old days where you could just go out, throw on an Ashigarami and you won the match. Um, and so who deals best with that kind of resistance is going to be the, those who, who, who do very, very well. So, um, so maybe not necessarily like leg lock offense, but, but more specifically like... Counter offense, oh. um, uh, uh, ones who can feed off the reactions to a threat. Um, the, if there's back exposure, you know, I enter, you can expose your back defending the leg lock, or I can expose my back working for the leg lock. Um, these are all... Uh, the ways in which you can win an ADCC. Um, but it's going to come down to who manages that initial threat best. Gotcha. Uh, but, but the leg lacks will still be a, a very big part. But in a different way. But in a different way. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Is there any other developments you, you expect to see? or um, who, who exploits the, uh, we call it the wrestling game, but let's be honest, the, the wrestling you see in ADCC is significantly different from, say, uh, freestyle or, or college styles of wrestling. Um, it has to be because there's submission holds involved mm -hmm. and the, the rules for the takedown are massively different. And so you'll see techniques drawn from wrestling, but the actual wrestling itself in ADCC, as I said, is significantly different from just pure uh, freestyle or collegiate. And so the athletes who manage that distinction best are going to do very, very well on ADCC. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to get your thoughts on here as well at ADCC. There's a big uh, super fight uh, um, on, uh, uh, on that weekend, of course. Um, the reigning defending ADCC super fight champion, Andre Galvao, will be taking on the um, absolute champion from 2017, uh, Felipe Pena. Mm. Um, both guys, you know, um, making their mark on the sport, both, I think, fair to say, legends uh, of the yeah. sport at, at this point. Um, you know, one of the biggest super fights I think you can make in the sport at this point. Um, I just wanted to get, get your thoughts on, on this matchup. I think it's going to be a good one. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating matchup. Um, it's complicated by the fact that one athlete is significantly older than the other. So that's always something you have to take into consideration. Um, in terms of uh, physicality, they're both very, very strong physical uh, combatants and they'll both be in tremendous shape when on, on the day. Um, when you look at Andre Galvan, he is—he's the master tactician. He's the guy who comes in. He—he he knows what he has to do to win the match. And uh, when you look at Felipe Pena, you see someone who's tactically aware. He's not naive about tactics, 
but he's more of a kind of a pure jiu-jitsu, let's go until someone taps kind of a guy. He's, he's, uh, I, would, I would give Penner the edge in just pure submissions potential, um, uh, but I would give Galvan the edge in, in tactics that can make you win on the day. And so it's going to be this fascinating battle of the young, brilliant athlete uh, with, a, with a brilliant, brilliant submissions game um, versus the older, more aware, tactical athlete who knows what it takes to exploit rules, tactics, etc., etc., to do just enough to, to, to shut out talented people and get there. A good example would have been um, uh, Galvan's match against Tokinho. Uh, remember when Tokinho mm -hmm. came in, I believe it was in London, uh, at ADCC, mm -hmm. and uh, he was just tearing up everybody. And um, finally got to Galvao in the final and put Galvao under tremendous pressure. Took him down numerous times, almost got to the legs a bunch of times. But Galvao knew just enough tactics and points awareness to, to take up a very, very hard fought match. And he went up against one of the most dangerous guys in submission grappling, shut him down, and got the win. And that's, that's his strong point, that's what he's best at. Um, uh, and you, I think you're going to see a, a match of that kind. It's going to be the, the uh, sort of um, submissions brilliance versus tactical uh, genius. Can I get you to make a prediction? I never give predictions. Gotcha. Yeah. So not this time either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a coach, not a fortune teller. Gotcha. Okay. And then you know, something that we love to speculate about, I don't know, and you don't know, make predictions, but but the um, absolute division. You know, we don't know who who will be be in there. And I was going to ask you who you think would win win the absolute division, um, but maybe there's like a, who you think will do well in, yeah, in the absolute. Yeah. We, don't, we don't know. We can never know who, um, the, who the, enters. Yeah, the but. absolute division is going to be crazy. Um, it's unlikely that Gordon Ryan's knee will be in shape to do the ADCC at this point. Uh, I'm not going to rule it out. It's possible, but um, even if he did come in to the event, he wouldn't have had uh, a good preparation for it. He just won't be ready in the time. Um, so it kind of leaves uh, an open field. There's a, there's a, a bunch of stellar athletes. Um, uh, obviously, the, the people, most people were keeping their eyes on someone like Bouchesha. Mm -hmm. he's, he's been there before and he's, he's just an absolute powerhouse. He's going to have a significant size advantage over most of his opponents. Um, uh, so he's got to be the leading contender, I think. And uh, uh, he came, he ran into Penner in the, in the last one. And it was a, it was a good match, but uh, Penner's dangerous with the submission holds, and he showed that in that match. Um, so I, th I think most people would favor uh, uh, Bouchesha for, for the heavy, uh, for the open weight this year. Mm -hmm. One of the only titles that uh, Bouchesha yeah, has, has yeah, not um, yeah. captured So, so yet. There's, a, there's a real motivation for him to go out there and, uh, and take it. But um, uh, I think most people would agree he would be the leading contender at this point. Mm -hmm. So we're just about two months away, I believe. Yeah. From, from Just a slightly over two yeah, months. Just slightly yeah. over two months. Um, you know, like I said, I can't believe it's coming up already. But, yeah. um, it, you know, it looked like things were in full swing here. You guys are, have you started ADCC yes. camp? Yeah. yeah. And can you maybe tell me how are things going? And, and I don't know, is, is there a different emphasis this time around? Um, yeah. Uh, the emphasis is more about getting younger athletes ready for competition. Um, uh, since Gordon is unlikely to be there and Gary is focused on mixed martial arts now, it's basically the juniors who are, who are going out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're also joined by Craig Jones, he's doing the full camp here. Um, he's a wonderful kid, by the way, yeah. training very, very well. And keep your eyes on Craig Jones for this uh, ADCC. He's added some very, very interesting elements to his game. He's getting a nasty front headlock and a nasty Kimura uh, attack. and. Um, I think he's going to be a very, very tough person to stop in, in this year's ADCC. We didn't mention him in the interview, but we should have. He's, he's coming along very well. Um, so uh, getting the juniors ready is, is what this camp is about. And um, uh, I'm happy with the fact that they're all so young that this is going to be one of many ADCCs that they compete in. And you mentioned um, a little bit earlier about about the points aspect mm. of, of, um, of ADCC. Is that something too that, that you guys are, 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 are focused on or, or are you guys still focused on the submissions? We're always going to be always, yeah. uh, submissions first, everything else second. That's never going to change. That's just, that's just my brand of, uh, of jiu-jitsu. Um, but we're realists too. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
if you if you're serious about winning ADCC and you you've got to be serious about how you're going to score points. And um, uh, at World Championship level, the submissions don't come easy. So uh, there has to be this this compromise between your desire to fulfill the ideal of the sport, which is submissions, and your desire to win a championship, which realistically, in at least half of the cases, you're probably going to have to do by points. Is this is this the, the funnest time for you, for, for, for a coach, for for? Some, oh yeah. Is, yeah. Is, are you living living the life where you know <laughs> the, the, the summer? It's it's like 105 degrees outside. Yeah, and, my, my it, life is always the same. It doesn't really change much. Um, but do um, you, do you revel in, in in this time this time period or this? Uh, there's always something coming up. Yeah, like true. Um, uh, like right after this, Gary Turner will be going back to mixed martial arts. There's there's always something, but uh, it definitely makes for an interesting. Um, week when you've, you've got guys getting ready for world championships here, you've got George St. Pierre thinking about coming back into the USC and you've got Gary Toner getting ready for his next fight and you've got a whole bunch of uh, competing interests and they're all very, very significant. Uh, and then there's other juniors who are getting ready for submission grappling tournaments around the country and you've got to keep them in, uh, under wraps too. So um, uh, it makes things interesting. I bet. I bet. <laughs> I don't know how you you keep it all straight in your mind with all these different <laughs> rule sets and MA and one day I'll have a complete meltdown, a psychological breakdown on the mat, and then you'll never hear from me again. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's fascinating stuff. Cool. Um, I, I just a couple um, non ADCC yeah. related questions, I guess, here for you too. Um, Right off the bat, one that I wanted to ask you about real quick, um, we were talking about MMA and, um, you know, I, I, last time or one of the last times I saw you, you were teaching a seminar with, with Ben Askren. Mm. And uh, so I know he's a That's he, right. yeah, he's, yeah, he's, a, he's yeah. a guy um, that, that you got to know well yeah. and, and uh, that seminar was, uh, you know, a highlight of my year last year. It was a, a, a great time. Um, I'm wondering if you got to see Ben's last fight um, yes, I did. by any chance. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people talking about it, obviously it was a spectacular um, kind of finish t to the fight. Um, but, I don't know, I just wanted to see if, if you had any thoughts about that. You know, you've been in, in MMA a long time and, yeah. and, and seen um, a lot of different things and, and, and seen people come back from big losses or, or seen people overcome ty types of things. I'm just wondering, obviously Ben's a, a great competitor, but... Do you, do you have any advice for, for somebody coming off of a, off of a, a big loss like that, or, or how to how yeah, to handle yeah, those types yeah. like um, those types of defeats? You've you've always got to ask yourself after the loss, how does this impact me going forward? Like um, really, the most devastating losses to a fighter aren't the losses that everyone talks about. Like. Uh, when, when, when Ben lost, it was an incredibly eye-catching moment. First, it was the shortest fight in UFC history. Okay? It, um, the nature of the knockout, a flying knee, that's always a highlight reel kind of a finish. Um, but really, they're not the most damaging kinds of uh, uh, fights to a, to a fighter's confidence because they all happen in a kind of a spontaneous mm. way. The most damaging ones to a fighter's confidence are fights where you get held down and beaten up for five rounds where you felt helpless because then you then the problem is one of technique okay where your technique was inadequate the problem with Ben's fight wasn't technique it was tactics now tactics you can change in 24 hours mm. but technique that's going to take years to change okay so when a, when a fighter loses the first question you've got to ask did you lose because of techniques would you lose because of tactics? If it's because of tactics, it's an easy fix. Okay, change your tactics. It's not that big of a deal. Mm. Um, but when you lose because of technique, that's a problem. Because now it's going to take you six months to a year to learn new techniques or improve the existing techniques to a level where you're competitive. Okay, Ben lost on tactics. Okay, um, that's that's just an easy thing to get around. Like when a guy runs at you from across the octagon. You can't just put your head down and move forward in a straight line. That's an easy thing to correct. Uh, so the big concern, of course, is, okay, what kind of physical damage did, did Ben Askren take? That I don't know because I don't know Ben well enough to ask those kind of questions. Um, now, I have seen uh, in combat sports athletes take knockouts that change them physically. Like, there is such a thing as a knockout which is so severe that the fighter is never quite the same again. I, that has happened. 
but it's pretty rare. It, and Ben, from what I understand in subsequent interviews and everything, seems to be fine. I don't, you know, it's not like he's walking around staring at the ceiling or anything crazy like that. Um, uh, and you know, he's led a, a life in combat sports. He's a tough dude. He's not the kind of guy who's going to get gun shy because he got knocked out one time. Um, so, provided there's no actual physical damage, uh, which doesn't appear to be the case based on his behavior since the fight, uh, yeah, he should be fine. Change tactics, come back next time and win. So it's uh, not quite as devastating maybe as everybody. No. no. Usually when most people say a fight is you know, done or career, they do it on emotion. They do mm -hmm. it on, you know, oh my God, a five second knockout, crazy, that guy's done. Yeah. So, well, how, why? Did he, you think he's just going to forget how? The guy won a lot of fights, okay, and he, he won them in a very convincing fashion. Yeah. You think he's just going to forget that? You're just going to forget that now because of one highlight reel knockout? No. And again, go back to what, what caused the loss, okay? If you're losing on technique, that's a serious issue. It's going to take you years to resolve that, and you might never resolve it. You might never pick up that technique. If you lose on tactics, no problem. Change the tactics. It's easy. I know you're a big fan of, of wrestling as well, yeah. and um, I, I've been meaning to ask you just about about the um, about some wrestling, um, just because I think you know right now it feels like um, a renaissance for for wrestling in the yeah, United States absolutely. as yeah. well. Would, would that be a, a fair yeah. statement? Yeah, no, the, the American team is it's, yeah. it's insane right now. It's crazy. What do you think? I don't know. Do you have any insight or, or any idea of maybe what caused that? Because because um, you, you had I believe 2017 they were the world. The team champions, yep. and then um, just last year, they, you know, Kyle Dake and David Taylor yep. finally realized their their full potential. Of course, Jordan Burroughs is, is is still on the team. Of course, Kyle Snyder is still racking up gold yep. medals. I mean, this is a, a, a an extremely impressive, a very 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 impressive. Um, I, I still think that Eastern European countries have a greater depth in wrestling. Like their, their number ten guy is still better than our number ten guy. Gotcha. Um, and that's an important consideration mm -hmm. because depth is very, very important when you're building uh, uh, infrastructure. But America hasn't had success like this in a long, yeah. long time. And in fact, this may be even unprecedented um, in terms of the international success that America is getting. Um, I don't believe I'm the right person to ask as to why this is happening uh, because I'm, uh, I think you'd have to go to the Olympic training centers in Colorado and, and ask there. They'd have a much better idea of it. But it's undeniable that this is going on and it's a, a thrilling time to be watching American wrestling right now. Um, uh, in general, just the way guys deal with uh, the rules of freestyle now seems to be a level above what it was 10, 15 years ago. And the transition from college to international styles of wrestling seems to be managed much better in the American system. Um, uh, so it, it's very, very heartening to see. In a way, it's kind of crazy because the population of people wrestling in the United States is very high. Mm -hmm. And yet the numbers of medals America was winning for a long time was comparatively low in comparison with relatively small parts of the world, like Chechnya, Dagestan, Ossetia, places like this. So I'm glad to see that America is redressing that. And um, uh, they've got some genuine superstars on their team now. These guys are just unbelievable. And um, uh, it's also a fascinating time within America to see their competition to try to represent America. It's it, like just to get on the American yeah. team now, it's hell, it absolute done. hell. Yeah. And um, we've gone from a team which had a few outstanding individuals to one where they're, they're strong everywhere and they're strong two or three deep mm -hmm. per weight division. So it's, it's really, really great to see. And I don't know if you saw this um, on social media last week, uh, Yuri Samoyes mm. came out and said that he would like to have a, a wrestling match or a grappling match with Kyle Snyder. It was kind of a... An oh, a wrestling match or a grappling match? He, he said either. He said, I would like to do both. You know, he said, I, he, you know, a wrestling match he, he said, he said he wanted to have a wrestling match and, and, you know, and then we could have a grappling match right after it. Or, you know, but he, he did. He speculated and he thought that, that he would... Does Kyle Snyder even know what grappling is? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I think he's definitely securely a, a wrestler. And, yeah, <laughs> but I, I think the wrestling match would be an absolute massacre. Yeah. <laughs> like, not even vaguely competitive. Yeah. And um, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know what Kyle Snyder's level of grappling is, so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure Yuri Samoy would win that just by a submission hole pretty easily. So it would just be a kind of a pointless match where one guy <laughs> crushes one guy in one area and one the other guy there. crushes the other guy in the other yeah so, yeah no, um, but I, I, w I wanted to ask you about um 
how do you, how do you think wrestlers would do in ADCC? You know, got, I mean, there, there's a big wrestling component to ADCC, mm -hmm. and of course, we don't know. Like I said, we don't know Cal's wrestling uh, pedigree. I mean, uh, grappling pedigree. Um, but we know he's a good wrestler. <laughs> they, first off, they, they're always going to have enormous potential. Yeah. Um, if you look at the track record of wrestlers in ADCC, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. You've got someone like Mark Kerr, who did extraordinarily well. But understand that Mark Kerr was pretty heavily immersed in MMA training at that point, so he was not naive at all. In mm -hmm. fact, he actually submitted a punch. If I remember rightly, he submitted Josh Barnett mm. for the Kimura, uh, don't quote me on that, but yeah. I'm pretty we'll sure look he did. Up. <laughs> look it up. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so, so he wasn't a naive wrestler who True. just came in with pure wrestling. He was already into his MMA career and had a lot of exposure to jiu-jitsu at that point. Um, you had Ben Askren, he went to ADCC and he got submitted in a matter of seconds by, uh, by leg lock. So very good wrestler, but perhaps a little naive on submissions. Um, Chris Weidman got all the way to the finals and arguably beat Andre Galvan. It was very, very kind of weird. I don't know how they scored it, but it could have gone either way. Um, and he had only done jiu-jitsu for around six months at that point in time. Now, don't get me wrong, Chris, I, obviously I know very well, he's a, yeah. a, a student who trained here for a long time. Um, uh, he did have an unusually good propensity to pick up jiu-jitsu. He would, like he, when he used to come here and train, mm -hmm. he would pull guard on people. Mm. Uh, he could have taken out anyone in the room, but he would just only pull guard and work from bottom position. So he had, he had a real propensity to learn jiu-jitsu and then add it to his wrestling. So um, what I will say about wrestlers in ADCC is they, they're always going to have enormous potential. Because wrestling breeds athletes who want to win. They're tough, they're physical, and in the standing position, they're incredibly good. Um, and the whole thing is, okay, how are they going to integrate that with jiu-jitsu? Because ADCC is always a mish, mishmash between wrestling and, uh, and jiu-jitsu. It's, it's, it's the matchup of the two. And so they're always going to have that potential, but how are they going to uh, manage the, the addition of jiu-jitsu to their game? Some guys did it incredibly well, Chris Weidman, Mark Kerr, some guys not so much. Um, uh, so my general answer to your question is, yep, they're always going to have potential, but answer me one question. How are they going to deal with submission holds? How is that going to be integrated into their training? And uh, how are they going to manage that? Understand, too, that wrestlers are all very, very different. We talk about wrestlers as though there's you know, one kind of wrestler. Yeah. There's wrestlers who are very good on the mat, and there's wrestlers who are typically very good on the feet. Um, and I generally find the mat wrestlers tend to pick up the jiu-jitsu game a, a lot easier than the, the takedown specialists. And um, uh, so someone like Chris Weidman, who was best on the mat, does very, very well. Um, interestingly, Ben Askren was very, very good on the mat, yeah. but seemed to struggle with submissions. So that was kind of like a, an, a, an anomaly there. But um, uh, people talk about wrestlers like they're all the same. You know, the, True, you know, it's a very good point. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot of variation within yeah. wrestling. And uh, you see some very, very big changes in style between different kinds of wrestling, different styles of wrestling, and even different locations in wrestling. Like the, the way the Iranians wrestle is significantly different from how the, um, the Russian Caucasus wrestlers uh, go to work, and of course from the American college styles. So there's, there's quite a bit of variation there. I know we're, um, we're getting a little late, I know you got a, got a class yeah. to teach here in just a little bit, so we'll try to wrap things up. But um, like we said, two, two months out from ADCC, um, I guess what, what's the plan from, or how, how will things go from, from now until, until the competition, mm -hmm. I guess? You know, we, we're, we're starting to, to, to get closer and closer day by yeah. day, uh, obviously. As a general rule, as time gets closer and closer, the main concern becomes physically peaking the athletes for the day, or in this case, two days. Um, so uh, when you're getting very close to the event, things like m managing weight cuts, um, keeping the athletes active through a weight cut without injuring them, that's, that's a big issue. Um, but right now we're still uh, over over two months away, so right now it's more about technique and tactics. So the emphasis right now is techniques, tactics, trying to keep injury rates as low as possible. That's difficult because it's got to be physical training. And uh, you, as much as you want to reduce injuries, you've also got to keep realism as well. So right now it's about the balance between physicality and safety, techniques and tactics. And as we get closer and closer to the event, the concern over safety increases. 
injuries one week before the event are much more serious than injuries two months before the event, um, along with managing weight cuts. And uh, uh, the general rule is things can be pretty physical now, but that physicality will start to diminish as you get closer and closer to the event. And hard sparring will be replaced more by uh, uh, drilling. September 28th and, and 29th, yeah. out in Los Angeles, California. It's uh, coming up very, very quick. You'll, you'll be out there, of course? Yes. You'll be out yeah. there co coaching um, your whole squad. And of course, we, we didn't get to really talk about um, Ethan and Oliver Taza um, yeah, as well. Those, but, but those are two guys. I mean, they both had standout performances in their first ADCCs. Yeah. And uh, they're both looking very sharp. And then uh, Nicky, Nick Rodriguez, we'll see if, if, if Gordon is, is, is healthy or not, but um, certainly... And of course, a, Craig Jones. And, and Craig, uh, Craig as yeah. well, somebody we didn't get to talk, talk about, but um, a, a huge squad you guys got, got, got bringing yeah. out there. I think, um, uh, once again, we had the most success in getting people into the event. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's half the battle, is getting to the event. True. And uh, for the last two ADCC now, I think we, did the, uh, we had the most success in getting the most athletes into the event. Um, uh, and now the question is, okay, you got there, what are you gonna do with it? Nice. Well, I absolutely cannot wait for this event. Um, you know, 2017 was one of the best times watching covering Jiu Jitsu for me, so I'm just ecstatic about uh, 2019. I can't wait for it. Of course, it's live on Flow Grappling, September 28th and 29th. John, thank you so much My for the time. I really, really appreciate it, as always. And uh, we'll see you guys next time.